Good morning. Welcome to Unit 4 and your fifth case study in AP Comparative Government. We're going to start this unit off with a fairly abbreviated history of the United Kingdom. This seems like a good time to disclose that I enjoy teaching the United Kingdom because I enjoy complaining about the United Kingdom, and I enjoy complaining about the United Kingdom for because I lived there for three years. Here's me standing in front of a nice fancy looking building in Oxford. Here's me meeting the queen. Just kidding, that's my sister wearing a mask that she found at a garden after presumably some undergraduates had a party and failed to clean up. Our parents were very embarrassed. Um, first, we need to cover uh, what this country is called anyway, because um, it turns out that's not actually a very intuitive question. So when we talk about the UK, um, the formal name for what we're talking about is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which has four constituent parts. You'll sometimes hear them called the four countries of the UK. Those are England uh, in the southeast, green blob, uh, Wales in the sort of southwest, this red blob, Scotland in the north, and then Northern Ireland, which is the northern uh, corner um, of an island to the west of uh, Great Britain. Um, Great Britain is this big landmass um, that includes England, Scotland, and Wales. Here it is. Um, and then Northern Ireland is separate. The formal name of this country is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. That's a lot of syllables, so in general, uh, we call it the UK. Um, when you're trying to refer to the people, uh, referring to British people is generally fine unless you really specifically want to talk about people from Northern Ireland. Um, usually, uh, it's okay to use Britain as a shorthand for the state that we're talking about. But the one thing you don't want to do is say, oh, in England, the political system, blah, 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 because England is only a constituent part of this larger political entity that we're talking about. I'm going to try and use the UK as much as possible, and I apologize to you in advance if I slip. Um, one random historical bonus uh, is that the flag of the United Kingdom, known as the Union Jack, actually carries within it um, kind of the history of the uh, the history of the nation, of the building of the, the modern British state. Um, there have been a few different formal unions of government um, that form what's now called the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, starting in 1535, Wales in the West is annexed to the Kingdom of England. Um, the flag of the Kingdom of England is this you know, fairly plain red cross on a white background and nothing cha changes when Wales is annexed, which is unfortunate because the Welsh flag is much cooler because it has a dragon. Then um, in the early 1600s, because monarchy is weird, um, Queen Elizabeth I dies. Uh, she's the Queen of England. And the person who inherits her crown and becomes James I of England already has a day job, which is being James VI of Scotland. So at this point, Scotland and England um, become ruled, they become united under the same crown. Um, and King James I of England, King James VI of Scotland, merges the Scottish and English flags together um, into this new one. In 1707, uh, trying to formalize the Union. Parliament is sort of casting around, the British legislator is casting around for a good name for this kingdom that's made from the Union of Scotland and England. And they say, gee, let's call it the United Kingdom. And they formalize that flag. Fast forward 100 years, Ireland to the West um, has been under varying degrees of British occupation uh, for a long time. But in 1801, Parliament passes this legislation called the Acts of Union, which kind of formalizes that colonization, not obviously without controversy. Uh, and they merge um, the Irish flag or the, the cross of St. Patrick, which is that diagonal cross, uh, into the previous British flag. And that turns into that new country is called the Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. In 1922, for reasons we'll touch on a little bit later today, um, most of the island of Ireland uh, secedes. They win their independence from Britain. Um, the British flag doesn't change, but the Republic of Ireland um, becomes an independent nation with its own uh, flag that you know, intentionally or unintentionally really clashes with the British color scheme. Um, a word to the wise, uh, Ireland usually means the Republic of Ireland, so be careful when you're talking, um, depending on the politics of the person that you're talking to, be careful when you're using Ireland as a shorthand for Northern Ireland, the part that's under British sovereignty, but we'll get there later in this unit. All right, to history. Britain has, of course, a really long and complex and rich and varied history, which I'm going to cover in like 20 or 30 minutes. So obviously I'm gonna leave a couple of things out. 
But the basic political trend that I want to identify over the last several centuries um, is the emergence and the shift in power between two institutions. One is the monarchy, um, the hereditary leadership of the United Kingdom, uh, which has all of the pomp and circumstance and the big castles and the fancy crowns and the jewels. And then Parliament, which is the institution that's supposed to represent at least a broader spectrum of British popular opinion. Um, Parliament originates, you know, England for a long time is essentially an absolute monarchy where the monarch has all of the power. Um, but as is common in many, especially European monarchies, the power of the monarch is somewhat limited, especially when the monarch needs money. Um, and so the institution of the parliament originates as this kind of ad hoc, you know, once in a while, only when we need a council of nobles, because these are the rich people who can cough up money to support whatever war or project it is that the king wants. And so parliament starts not as a formal institution, but really as just a group of the king's buddies who are called together to give advice and also to get their buy-in so that they'll be willing to pay the taxes that the king needs in order to finance his projects. Over time, Parliament evolves into an institution with more responsibility and with more permanence um, and with, as you see on your screen, a, a permanent meeting building um, at Westminster. Um, the Prime Minister, who today is the head of government in the United Kingdom, currently Boris Johnson, um, the position of Prime Minister, who's again now the most important person in British politics, originates not as an elected job, not even as somebody who is chosen by the members of Parliament themselves, um, but as kind of the uh, the you know number one person that the King's going to go to among the members of Parliament when the King is looking for advice and counsel. The term Prime Minister is actually first come up with as kind of a derogatory term. Um, people who use it to describe the first prime minister, Robert Walpole, um, are actually using it to criticize his kind of arrogance and pretension in saying, oh, I'm first among all of the other ministers in parliament. But over the next 300 years or so, it's going to evolve into a position um, of really significant responsibility, first in advising the king or the queen, and then in just making significant governing decisions, which is what it is today. So the theme you should already be identifying from this really high level history is that change in British politics tends to be gradual and not revolutionary. So over time, um, that person, that character of the prime minister, uh, who starts out as being just the person who sort of happens to have won the trust of the king in parliament, turns into a more institutionalized role. Um, and that person today uh, is now not just, you know, sort of randomly arbitrarily picked by the monarch, um, but rather chosen because they're the leader of the majority party or the largest party in parliament, because they can win the confidence of a majority of members of the House of Commons. Um, and so that, that office becomes both more institutionalized, more powerful, and more closely attached to the person's membership in the parliament. Same thing for the cabinet, which is the body of other sort of high level members of parliament who have particular responsibility for uh, specific areas of policy and specific sort of wings of the bureaucracy. Couple themes here. Number one, um, Although the power of the monarchy has definitely diminished over time, um, with the exception of the English Civil War in the 17th century, it never completely goes away. And so theoretically, symbolically, um, there's always been this idea in British politics that the that parliament uh, kind of represents or wields or is authorized to carry out the authority of the crown, the authority of the monarch. Um, and so the prime minister, as I've said numerous times in kind of trying to illustrate the, the distinction between a head of state and a head of government, um, the British head of government um, does not, you know, go and ask the queen very frequently before implementing any kind of policy. So the head of state, the monarch, doesn't have a whole lot of role in day-to-day -day governance. But there's still this really important symbolic set of relationships um, between the crown and the government um, that kind of reflect this idea that parliament gets to exercise its authority because it's ultimately acting on behalf of the sovereign. And so here you see a much derided moment for Theresa May, who is the uh, most recently departed prime minister of the United Kingdom. She served from 2015 to 2019. Um, she, uh, on her first meeting with the queen, kind of couldn't decide how to show her deference um, and decided to enact this sort of weird curtsy kneel situation um, and took a lot of crap in the British press for that. Um, 
there are not a second theme that you want to note is that as parliament has become uh the the governing institution of great britain there's not actually a lot of formal checks on parliament's power in theory that check might be one of those checks might be the monarch but in practice it would be extraordinarily controversial um and extraordinarily widely criticized if the monarch ever you know, tried to step in to override a decision taken by parliament or a decision taken by the prime minister similarly um partly because parliament represents that authority of the sovereign, that authority of the monarch. Um, there's not a tradition of, you know, sweeping judicial review in the United Kingdom. They do have a Supreme Court, which we'll get to later this week. Um, but the Supreme Court doesn't actually have the power to strike down acts of parliament, except in very limited circumstances. And that too reflects the fact that the UK, again, frustratingly to me, doesn't have a single written document which makes up its constitution. So it's tough to get a majority in parliament, obviously, but once you have a majority in parliament, if you can keep that majority united, um, uh, uh, you know, a prime minister with a strong majority in parliament and a clear vision for what they want to do can enact some pretty sweeping policy transformations in Britain. This is a system, like all the systems we've studied, but maybe to the greatest degree, which is really held together much more by norms than by formal checks and balances or by formal separation of powers. One other trend to note in the long history of the United Kingdom is that the relationship between church and state is perhaps different from what an American might expect of a country that we're going to you know, pretty happily call a liberal consolidated democracy. Um, you may have learned uh, from, I don't know, a certain dashingly handsome AP world history teacher at CRLS um, that shortly after the Protestant Reformation takes root in Germany, uh, in 1538, King Henry VIII um, the most fascinating, I think, of all English kings, um, decides that he doesn't want to be a Catholic anymore and specifically decides that he would like to be able to have his first marriage annulled because his wife is failing to, you know, uh, perform her sacred duty and have a son. Um, so Henry asks the Catholic Church for an annulment of his marriage so that he can get married again in the eyes of the church. The Pope says, nah, you don't really have a legitimate reason to do that. And so Henry says, fine, screw it. I'm the head of the church in England. That sets off a chain of events that we know as the English Reformation, um, in which the United Kingdom peels away from the Catholic Church, at least officially, um, and establishes this new institution called the Church of England, otherwise known as the Anglican Church. It's branched in the United States for reasons that have never been clear to me. It's called the Episcopalian Church, but they're part of the same uh, institution. Um, the English Reformation doesn't just put England more on the Protestant side of things, it also brings the church in England under the control of the state. So when Henry says, nope, I am an Anglican now, I'm not a, I'm not a Catholic, he's also saying, and I'm the head of the Church of England because I'm the head of England. He proceeds to get married five more times. Um, couple results that matter even after Henry VIII is dead. The first is um, there is going to be some enduring tension between Catholics and Protestants. Not everybody in the United Kingdom is going to um, convert immediately to Anglicanism or be happy with the switch. Uh, there will be some people who maintain their loyalty to the Pope. In most of Britain, that's not a huge issue today. The place where it really matters politically is Northern Ireland, and I'll show you a map in a moment. A second implication is that Parliament actually gets expanded authority because Henry can't, um, Henry doesn't just unilaterally decree himself to be the head of the church in England. He goes to Parliament in order to seek more legitimacy for this decision, in order to seek more authority, um, and he asks them to pass a law that makes him the head of the church in England. Um, and so Parliament's role in, in sort of substantive decisions is expanded as a result of Henry setting this precedent that they get to make that call. And then finally, the church is brought under the formal authority of the state. So you don't see the church acting very much as a substantial check on the power of the sovereign or as a check on the power of parliament, the way that you will in other European countries which remain Catholic or which, which continue to have a separate church and state authorities um, during this historical period. Take a quick look at this map, if you will. Um, You'll notice in, in this map, uh, blue, darker blue areas are more Protestant, more Anglican. Um, darker red areas are more heavily Catholic. And you'll see that the one place in the UK where there's really significant intermingling um, of Catholics and Protestants is right here in Northern Ireland. 
We'll talk a little bit about Northern Ireland later in this unit, but just want to foreground for you um, that, you know, religious tension, religious social cleavages um, are really a, an, an important factor, although certainly not the only factor um, in the you know, ongoing tense relationship between the UK and Ireland and specifically between Catholics and Protestants within Northern Ireland. One other map while we're looking at maps. Um, as you may have learned from really any history teacher anywhere, um, at various points during the 18th, 19th centuries, the British Empire, uh, you know, the British established the biggest empire in the world. Um, this map is, you know, doesn't show the empire at its full extent, most notably, uh, you know, at one point, as you probably are aware, uh, British control included the United States of America. Um, and so, um, this is an important piece of sort of British history, but also of British political identity. And there are some people to this day in the UK, although it's not a super popular opinion anymore, who still defend the idea that the British Empire was ultimately a good thing for the world, including the colonized people who lived in it. Let's fast forward now. Um, to the sort of modern era of British politics, the contemporary era, which is uh, after World War II. A couple things happen after World War II. So the British, as you probably are aware, if not, I'll recommend you any of like 17 movies on the subject, um, kind of heroically fight and defend their country against Nazi invasion or the threat of Nazi invasion, rather. Um, they rally, they support the allied cause. Uh, there's this great kind of moment of collective sacrifice. Prime Minister Winston Churchill distinguishes himself as maybe the greatest British prime minister of all time um, by his wartime leadership. And then suddenly in 1945, he manages to lose an election. Um, by the end of World War II, Britain's uh, political competition has been boiled down to a two-party system uh, with a party called the Labour Party on the left or the liberal side of the, the attitudinal spectrum. As you can probably tell from the name, the Labour Party is um, you know, emerges from its roots in the workers' movement, uh, and at least at its beginning, espouses this fairly democratic socialist ideology. On the other side is a party formerly known as the Conservatives, commonly nicknamed the Tories. Churchill's a conservative, um, and he is, you know, almost universally beloved uh, in wartime England for his leadership um, and for his sort of fortitude and for rallying the nation. But in kind of a surprise, um, in 1945, there's a general election and the conservatives, Churchill's party, lose to the Labour Party. And so this guy, Clement Attlee, um, becomes prime minister. Under the post-war labor government, you're going to see a couple of big policy trends. One is the dismantling of the British Empire. Um, at this point, sort of, it's hard to have fought a war claiming to you know, be defending democracy and then you know, go turn around and exercise very undemocratic control uh, over millions and millions of people in, say, Kenya or Nigeria or India. Um, and so the empire gets kind of unwound in the 20 years following World War II. Second, um, Attlee's government and its successors implement a bunch of major reforms, basically along the lines of thinking that the British people have sacrificed immensely um, in order to, to get themselves through the Depression and through the Second World War. Wartime rationing in Britain actually, in its, in its last vestiges, actually persist for several years after the surrender of Nazi Germany. And so the Labour government says, now it's time that we have, after we've successfully escaped the threat of Nazi invasion, it's now time for us to turn around and rebuild British society. So they implement a bunch of really sweeping reforms in terms of social and economic policy. One is the establishment of the National Health Service, uh, which is a single payer socialized medical system in the UK, which remains um, pretty immensely popular in the UK today. The NHS is in fact such an important part of the British sort of collective consciousness or identity that in 2012, when the city of London hosted the Olympics in their opening ceremony, um, where they presented kind of an interpretive dance version of all British history. They included a specific trampoline routine to pay a homage to the National Health Service. I'll put a link to that on my website. So Britain establishes uh, un essentially universal health care funded by taxpayers. Um, they nationalize key sectors of industry. So a lot of major uh, pieces of the economy are put directly under government control. Um, they engage, the labor governments especially, engage in regular consultation with trade unions. So you might smell kind of some, some little whiffs of corporatism here. That wouldn't be entirely um, 
inaccurate. Um, but the labor governments especially do a lot to try and ask representatives of workers um, how to make policy that's going to affect those workers directly. Um, and then finally, the government invests a bunch of money in creating an extensive welfare system that tries to provide benefits to the poor. They expand the availability of free public education. Uh, they expand subsidies for university tuitions. They expand the availability of public housing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the UK just moves very dramatically um, from a pretty sort of liberal capitalist economy to a much more social democratic economy um, in the couple of decades after World War II. What's really to my mind remarkable about this, and certainly what's important about this for our CompGov purposes, is that both parties uh, support these, this massive expansion of the welfare state. So that's why this period is known as being characterized as a collectivist consensus, which is to say that there's a consensus, there's a widespread agreement across uh, the, you know, the, at least the middle of the political spectrum um, that the government should be responsible collectively for the welfare of its citizens. And that's going to last into the late 1970s. But wait, Margaret Thatcher is going to show up. Margaret Thatcher, uh, sometimes known by her nickname of the Iron Lady, there's a movie with Meryl Streep of that title, um, becomes prime minister in 1979. Um, she is Britain's first female prime minister. Um, she's a Tory. She's a conservative. Um, she sort of, uh, you know, prides herself on her working class or middle class roots. Her father was a grocer. Uh, she kind of worked her way up from the bottom, got a degree in chemistry, I think, at Oxford University, worked as a scientist for a while, and gets involved in conservative politics. Um, and Thatcher smashes the collectivist consensus. She just throws it completely out the window. She calls for a few major policy priorities. One is for privatizing a lot of those sectors of industry that had been taken over by the government um, during, you know, after World War II, uh, during the collectivist period. Um, she believes that free market, you know, for pro you know, profit oriented interests are just going to run the economy better, more efficiently, more effectively than the government is. So she wants to shrink the size of the government and its role in the economy. Um, she calls for Britons to, and I'm paraphrasing here, pull themselves up by their bootstraps to rely on themselves. She thinks that an extensive welfare state breeds dependency on the government, and so she wants to do away with that. Um, and of course, she wants to lower taxes um, on the British people in order to you know, free up their, their money to spend however it is that they want. Um, Thatcher... Uh, does a lot to uh, dismantle that welfare state, although it certainly doesn't go away. And in particular, the National Health Service remains a really widely popular feature of the British economy. And you still routinely see politicians from you know all parties saying, we need to give more money to our NHS. We're very proud of our NHS. But Thatcher initiates this kind of wave of deregulation, of privatization. Um, as you might know from you know your more recent world history, uh, she's really very good buddies with President Ronald Reagan in the United States. And they're very ardent anti-communist in their foreign policy as well. Um, but it's really Thatcher and her government um, that kind of reintroduce some real conflict over the appropriate role of the state in the economy and in people's lives into British politics. Um, the Labour Party will fight Thatcher um, unsuccessfully. They lose a lot of ground in the 80s and 90s, in the 80s. Um, and then uh, comes a Labour Party leader named Tony Blair, um, who becomes a prime minister with a Labour majority in 1997. Uh, and he uh, kind of comes to power at the under the banner of something that he calls new labor. He's claiming to be reinvigorating or revitalizing or reinventing the Labour Party. And what he does is move the Labour Party really significantly to the right. So his agenda calls for kind of a third way between traditional free market capitalism and social democracy. Um, he says, oh, I'm pragmatic. I'm not ideological. Lots of politicians will say that. But this, you know, kind of fits with Blair's policies of not hewing to traditional labor ideology. Um, he calls for fiscal responsibility. He really wants to balance the budget, which has not been a major concern uh, for labor governments before him for a while. Um, he wants to, this is not a political economic decision. This is just a political or social decision. He wants to devolve power to Scotland and Wales. We'll talk about this later in the week, but um, the, the British system is a unitary system. There are no constitutionally protected powers for subnational units of government, um, but he wants to send some governing powers back 
to the subnational units of government, um, in part because there's starting to be some separatist noises in Scotland, um, in part because he has the belief that you know more local governments may, might be able to be more responsive to the needs of people in their areas. Um, but Blair finally continues to call for strong public services. Um, he says, we don't need to dismantle the welfare state entirely. We should still be providing for people. Um, but the pattern that he establishes is to move labor significantly to the right on the you know left-right uh, liberal conservative spectrum um, and to create some significant disaffection uh, among more left-wing members of the Labour Party, which will really finally come rearing its head in like 20 years when Jeremy Corbyn comes onto the scene. But I've reached the end of all I wanted to tell you about the history of the United Kingdom. Um, we'll get to the more recent 20 years of British politics over the course of the next week and a half. Thank you very much. That's all. So we're going to spend a lot of time over the next week and a half talking about the last 20 years worth of events in British political history, but I just want to give you an overview of all that um, so that you have a little context when we start jumping around from Johnson to Theresa May to David Cameron, blah, blah, blah. So Tony Blair stays in office for 10 years. Um, he's a pretty effective prime minister in terms of his ability to pass policies. Um, one of the really big sort of black marks on his reputation, though, is that he really enthusiastically supports in 2003 um, the Bush administration's decision to invade Iraq, which was really controversial at the time uh, and remains controversial today. Um, and that kind of drags down his popularity. Blair resigns in 2007 after 10 years as prime minister, and he hands the reins over to, George, to Gordon Brown, um, also a labor prime minister who had previously been the chancellor of the exchequer, which is basically the head of Britain's treasury. Um, Brown serves for three years, but he has the great misfortune of just a year into his premiership, a year into his leadership, um, Britain gets hit by the Great Recession, this global event that um, obviously is going to drag down the popularity of Brown and of the Labour Party. So in 2010, when the British economy is still kind of suffering, um, there's another general election, and the result of that election, where everybody in Parliament is up for election at the same time, everybody in the House of Commons, which is the elected House, um, the result is what's known as a hung Parliament, kind of an awkward phrase which refers to a Parliament where no single party has a majority. Um, so Brown tries to find a coalition of multiple parties that will give him a majority of votes to stay the prime minister, but he fails. And so the conservatives get the next shot at forming a government. Um, and the guy who succeeds in doing that is the leader of the Tories, the leader of the conservatives, uh, a fresh faced young man named David Cameron. So David Cameron becomes the prime minister in 2010. Um, he brings the conservatives back into power. But the problem for him is um, he doesn't have a majority of his own party in parliament. And so he needs the support of at least one other party to make sure that he has enough votes to remain the head of government for the United Kingdom. Um, so there's a small third party kind of in the center of British politics called the Liberal Democrats, Lib Dems for short. Um, and in order to become prime minister, Cameron has to get the support of the Lib Dems. And as part of what he's going to do in order to get their support, um, he will agree to bring on the leader of the Lib Dems as his deputy prime minister. I'm going to get my head out of the way so you can see that guy. His name is Nick Clegg. Clegg is going to kind of serve as the deputy prime minister and bring the Liberal Democrats into what's called that coalition government under Cameron's leadership. Uh, and so there will be this kind of unexpected Tory Lib Dem coalition um, in power for the next five years. In 2015, there's another general election. This time, the Conservatives win an outright majority in the House of Commons, meaning that Nick Clegg's services are no longer necessary, and so he goes away. David Cameron, uh, from 2015 to 2016, is the Prime Minister in his own right, uh, without any deputy um, from a different party attached to him. However, there's one tiny little problem for David Cameron which is that in the 2010s, a larger and larger number of people in the UK, including some small parties and some major critics, are starting to say, we no longer want to be members of the supranational organization called the European Union. We're going to spend some time later in this course talking about what the EU is and what it does and why British people might or might not want to be in it. Um, but what's important for now is that 
David Cameron and a lot of sort of establishment elite uh, Tory figures want to remain in the EU, but there are lots of people in the grassroots of the Conservative Party and other parties to the right of the party politically who want out of the EU. And in order to get those more uh, Eurosceptic, anti-European Union voters on his side, in 2015, when he's campaigning in this general election, David Cameron says, I don't want to leave the EU, but if it'll quiet you down and if it'll get you to vote me back as prime minister, I will agree to hold a referendum, a nationwide vote on whether Great Britain should leave the European Union. And he campaigns vigorously against it. He actually brings Tony Blair and Gordon Brown back to do this big stay in the EU campaign in the run up to that referendum in 2016, but they lose. And so in June of 2016, in what's considered by lots of international observers, kind of a shocking event, um, the people of the United Kingdom vote to leave the European Union. David Cameron is kind of obviously embarrassed by this because he has put his entire political reputation on being able to convince the British people to go with him and stay in the EU. And so in 2016, he resigns as the leader of the Conservative Party. There's not a new general election. There's just been general election within the last year. Um, But when Cameron steps down as the leader of the party that has the majority in parliament, because that's how parliamentary system works, his successor as leader of the Conservatives is going to become the Prime Minister. So the Conservatives have this internal leadership election amongst themselves, um, and the winner of that election is Theresa May. She serves as uh, Prime Minister from 2016 to 2019, um, but her big task is trying to get Parliament to pass essentially a divorce agreement with the European Union to pass the legislation that's required to enact the people's decision um, to do Brexit. And May's proposals are really um, unpopular with Parliament and with lots of people. In part, this isn't her fault because um, it's just really difficult to get a majority of British people on the side of any possible Brexit agreement, which is again something that we'll talk about um, in class in the next two weeks. In part, it reflects her own sort of limited skills as a campaigner, Um, but in 2019, um, May steps down as leader of the Conservative Party. It's kind of clear to her that she can't accomplish her major um, policy objectives of getting Brexit done, and she is replaced by the current Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. And yes, he actually intends for his hair to look like that. That's all I have to say about British history for now. Uh, We will come back to some of this recent stuff over the course of the next couple weeks. Thanks.